Hi everyone, this is Rohit from Lifestyle Mastery and today I'm excited to have Arthur Bernard, who's a general partner at Athletico Ventures with the aim of helping at, uh, elite um, athletes invest in the best promising startups alongside tier one investors focusing on Europe, late seed to series B across the consumer impact and sports entertainment verticals. Welcome to the show, Arthur. Thank you, right. Awesome. So you know you have an interesting journey. You 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 worked in agencies and then you got into venture capital. But what got you in, into this crazy world of venture capital? I, actually, I got into venture before the sports marketing agencies. Um, okay. So just out of school, oh. um, I I joined a fund called Alven, uh, based in Paris. Nice. Um, one of the really good uh, VCs in Paris, uh, and I took over the internship of one of my best friends over there. Um, I, I love the experience and make great people over there. Some of them are, are probably among the most successful EU investors today. Nice. Um, but I didn't stay long because I, I just wanted to move on the startup side uh, where okay. I, I joined uh, a company called BetClick, uh, which is a bookmaker. Um, okay. At an early stage, we, we grew from 200 people to 1,200 people in a matter oh. of three days, uh, three years when I was there. Nice, um, interesting. And, and I came back to VC in 2020. Right. Um, after some time in the VC and startup world, some time in the agency world, sports agency world. Um, so in 10, 2020, we we sold Sport5 uh, to HID, a private equity group. Um, and that's when I left the company uh, and 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 decided to to go back to the VC world because I I thought that I, I had the uh, it was time for Europe to replicate what had been going on um, in the US for decades uh, and meaning for athletes to start investing in startups. Oh, okay. Okay. Very interesting. Uh, and you mentioned you worked in uh, in, a, in a startup and then you worked in an agency. Um, how was your experience working in, in the agency uh, along with, uh, you know, the startups? Um, what were some of, some of your learnings over there? Um, so it was it was a sports marketing agency, um, and and what was great it was the fact that we we were doing almost all um, types of of businesses across the sports industry. Uh, so we were doing event management, talent management, media rights sales, marketing rights sales, brand consulting across plenty of geographies. Um, so you could never get bored. That was the first <laughs> the first thing. So many different businesses. Uh, it was it was really interesting. Um, and and I was also lucky with my role because I was uh, SVP corporate strategy yes. um, in, in a company that had been built through acquisitions, um, but that had barely been integrated up to the point I joined. So there was a lot to do in terms of integrating the different businesses together um, to make it a, a consistent company uh, across the geographies and across the globe. Um, so it was it was amazing. Plus, it was at the time of uh, quick evolution of the sports industry. Uh, so we had to challenge ourselves on how we do business. Um, for instance, we we almost killed one of our biggest business lines because we we didn't see it was uh, see it as sustainable over the long term, um, which is a uh, not always easy to to do. Like kill a business that is uh, generating a lot of profits. Yeah, yeah, interesting. And was it a conscious decision to work in a you know like a sports agency? Were you very uh, you know uh, involved in sports and that is why you took up this job role? Um, yes and no. And I'd say rather no. Um, I, I Almost all my career, I work close or within the sports industry. Uh, nice. BetClick was a bookmaker. Um, sport 5 was a sports marketing agency. And now I'm still working with athletes. <clears throat> but my choices have always been driven by the content of what I was going to do. Uh, and the, and the actual role I was going to uh, to to do. So, for instance, when I when I joined Sport Five, um, the idea behind joining was first and foremost because I was going to work with someone I knew from before, and I knew I was going to learn a lot from him. Uh, and also because the uh, the challenge I mentioned just before, where um, we we had to do almost everything in terms of integrating the different businesses together uh, with almost a blank. A sheet of paper uh, was an amazing challenge that I wanted to take up. Very interesting. And since you you started with um, Athletic Ventures in two thousand and twenty, 
how do you think the role of in uh, of athletes in the venture capital ecosystem has has evolved uh it's a it's a good question it's it's in constant evolution um i i think uh, i think when i started four years ago now um it felt a bit lonely in terms of educating the market because it was still very early stage in, in europe um there were plenty of examples in the us of athletes investing in tech but it was very new in europe uh, you only had a, a couple of examples like andy murray um so we we had to do a lot in terms of educating the market both on both sides on on with athletes and their managers on one side and with entrepreneurs and their investors on the other side um e- explaining what was the uh, the reason for athletes to invest and the and the potential value add um so yeah a, a, a lot of of education um and we still have a lot of education to do but it's it's slightly different today um so mostly because when you when you explain that you work with athletes people will tend to think that um you only invest in sports uh, or or consumer uh, and you are mostly focused on bringing hype and PR to the companies you you invest in, um, and it's actually much more complex than that. Uh, we we strongly believe in the in the unique value add of of athletes, uh, but but we think they have much more to bring than just influence, um, like their competitive mindset, uh, their social skills, um, their dedication, uh, business and political networks are also strong assets that they, they can bring to the companies they invest in. Um, and so at first we had to de- educate the market about why atle- uh, athletes can invest. And now it's more about um, how they can invest and, and, and the fact that they can invest in much more than just sports and consumer. Um, so still educating the market. The good thing is there are a lot more people doing the same thing uh, as, as we do. Um, so you, you have other groups of investors and you also have other individuals like Mario Godze, for instance, in Germany, is doing a great job at investing outside of the obvious. Um, so it's good to have more people moving in that direction. Got it. Got it. Interesting. And, um, you, you know, uh, I've been fascinated by uh, by the sports ecosystem here in Europe. Obviously, you know, soccer uh, is such a such an important uh, game out here in Europe. Um, but I was just wondering, you know, when it comes to, uh, you know, athletes investing into, into tech startups, what is the sort of contribution that these athletes are doing when it comes to investment decisions? Or do they, do they really uh, have any say when it comes to uh, making those decisions? They, they do have a say. It, it depends how you are structured. Uh, right. If it's a if it's a direct investment, uh, it's quite obvious that they, they do have a say because they are deciding. Right. Um, when it's through a, a fund structure or something like that, um, they it depends on how you are structured. In in our case, um, they have a say because we want them to get to be involved uh, in in the decision process. Because being involved in the decision process is the best way for them to know about the portfolio companies and to to be in a position to in, engage with those portfolio companies. Uh, because if you invest without them being involved, uh, then it, it becomes much harder um, to uh, to go back to them at some point and say, hey, that company needs some help. Can you help uh, if they are no, not aware of the, of the company? So we've decided uh, to involve them in, in the decision process. Um, coming, coming back to, to your question, I think, uh, what they are, there are a few things that they are really good at. Uh, one is um, they are really good at reading people. Uh, I think their, their social skills are are really good, um, and yeah, that, that's quite impressive. And and it's a consistent uh, observation. Um, they they also know what they don't know, uh, and they are really humble with that, uh, which basically uh, translate into they are not trying to step over what I'm doing, which is more the um, the deep dives and, and, and the analysis of the numbers, for instance. Um, they know that's not their core strengths in, 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 in most cases, and they'll focus on product markets, founders, uh, where they can have a say and, and, and a view. Um, and the last thing is they are street smart. They are street smart. 
and <laughs> which is really valuable because uh, they they yeah they they come with less uh, preconceived ideas uh, yeah. and and yeah and their street smartness is really helpful. Interesting and you know. I'll... Uh, as, as a first time, you know, we 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 see partner. What what was your experience on you know closing the first round, first fund, and you know how, how was the interaction with uh, LPs uh, when it came to closing it? Yeah, I I think we so it was it was tough. Uh, obviously, yeah. uh, closing the first one is difficult. I think we in a way we we had the right approach. Um, a stage approach where we started with uh, doing SPVs. Um, so okay. investing as uh, a syndicate or club deal, there are plenty of names. Um, so basically um, presenting deal by deal opportunities to athletes uh, for them to invest, which was a way to obviously build a track, track record uh, while also building trust with the investors, so the athletes, um, and also building the network and the trust with funds and entrepreneurs alike. So um, we we spent the first 18 months working exclusively as a club deal um, to build all the elements I just mentioned. And it's only once we had proven that first point and also uh, had the first few early wins in terms of companies uh, that we felt confident enough to start raising a fund. And, and I think it was it was the right decision because right out of the gates, when we started raising the fund, we had a few athletes that were already on board. Like, yes, I've done a few deals with you. I trust you. Uh, let's go for it. Got it. Interesting. And um, uh, and uh, I was just wondering, you know, when it comes to uh, an LP and GP relationship, you know, what is what are the single biggest misalignment between both of them? <laughs> it's a good question. Uh, if we can get a bit philosophical, uh, I'd say it's the difference between why LPs buy into VC and what they are actually buying into. Uh, but l l let's be more pragmatic. Um, I, I think the, the biggest issue is um, the, finding the right balance between uh, management fees and carried interest. Um, okay. And and when you get to certain fund size, like very large funds, the, the management fees can start to be very significant. Yeah. Um, and, and therefore, uh, it, it, there could be a misalignment uh, or lower alignment uh, between GPs and LPs. Um, it's, I, I don't feel too much concerned by the question because uh, we are still a small fund and we aim yep. to we are aiming to stay as a small fund so i i strongly believe in in small size um as a way to not losing track of that alignment and and making sure that the management fees are just just enough to run the company but you'll you'll get a real reward if you if you deliver returns got it and um and you mentioned an interesting point about the the carry fees, um, right, uh, and and the management fees, but but how how's carry a, a, an issue for for LPs, uh, and you know do you, do you look at, uh, you know somebody scouting a deal for you, or you do you look at you know providing Sorry, a different I, carry? I, 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 I was not saying carry is an is an issue. I was saying sometimes management fees can become so significant right. that there is obviously you still want to earn the carry, uh. But maybe you are a bit less angry because the management fees are <laughs> largely enough. Right. Oh, okay. Okay. Got it. And and how do you look at you know portfolio construction? How do you look at you know how much of your fund should be allocated per sector? Um, I I don't think I, I'll I'll give you any uh, new answer to that one. Direct uh, diversification is critical uh, across geographies, sectors, business models. Uh, risk reward profiles, uh, time horizons as well, right. um, and and the way we look at it is we we build a roadmap to start with uh, in terms of uh, 
where we want to invest across those different uh, elements. And then you keep refining it as you do your deals uh, because you, you need to factor in what you've done to see what remains to be done. Got it. And um, uh, especially, you know, 2022, 23 has been, uh, been you know, difficult years, but, uh, but, you know, we are recording in early 2024. But what, what happens to all those companies which with years of runway, but they don't have any product market fit? Uh, what should they do? Should they return back the money or they should should they ideate and look at something else? Yeah. Uh... It's a it's a tricky question. Uh, it's 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 really a concern for us because we are more late seed Series A investors, so we usually come in when there is a product market fit. Right. Um, so I'm not sure I'd, uh, I'm the best person to answer, but I I can try. Um, I'd say that smart founders or the best founders um, are really good at uh, iterating and 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 at a high velocity so that they can find new um, go-to-market strategies, uh, improve the product and so on until they find product market fit before they run out of cash. Um, so that's probably where you see the difference between the best funders and, and the others. Got it. And, you know, uh, as we're entering a new age of efficient company building, you know, especially uh, with how, you know, funding had dried up in the last couple of years, um, do you think we'll uh, go back to, you know, high burn environments and ex excessive funding? Or do you think we'll, we'll now be more efficient with, with, uh, with, with, with our resources? Um, I, I, I tend to think that a, a large chunk of the market will, will be more focused on, on efficient company building. Uh, mostly because that's the, the most relevant strategy in most cases. Um, um, and, and I think the industry just lost a, a bit sight of that uh, during the bubble. Um, but at the same time, you will always have a few segments of the markets uh, and it's most likely AI at the moment yeah. uh, where entrepreneurs and investors alike tend to think that they are winner takes all markets or winner takes most. Um, and, and, and in, in those cases, um, people will continue to raise a lot of money, to burn a lot of money, to gain those uh, leadership positions. Um, but I, I think I think people are now a bit more reasonable in terms of that does not apply to every sector. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely you're right about about the AI. I think with Chat GPT coming in, in last year, I think it's been uh we I mean it's it's great that they've uh you know had a had a great valuation and there's a lot of drama around AI, but it needs to be seen, you know, how other AI companies are going to uh you know take advantage of this and and turn into into into, into big revenues. Um and yeah, you know, I just wanted to follow on that. Uh, what what I mean, some some of the biggest lessons in which, uh, in what the you know best founders want from their VCs, especially at early stage and pre seed and seed. Uh, what sort of uh, help do they need, and what sort of VCs should uh, a founder look for? Um, I think a, a few years ago, um, some founders were focusing on the check. Um, and that was the opportunity for a few uh, crossover funds to uh, come in earlier than, uh, than what they were used to and, and maybe overpay a bit some companies. Um, what we find really interesting with some founders today and, and uh, an important part of them is that they are being very smart about the way they build their cap tables. Um, and they, they usually look for one or two lead investors, financial investors, right. um, that are bringing a large chunk of the money, but also um, experience in, in building companies because they are VC investors and, and they know how to work alongside entrepreneurs and, and to challenge them and to help them, um, very generally speaking. And then they, they keep a small portion of the fundraise um, available to 
business angels uh, that can be um, senior execs from corporates that can be former entrepreneurs from the same sector or, or with the same business model and athletes, for instance, because they see a strategic value from those investors and they are happy to have them on the cap table. And, and, and we, I think we see more and more founders um, being very smart about the way they build their cap tables. And, and yeah, that's, that's an observation of the recent months. Got it. And um, I know you're still in the early early days of your fund, but what's been your what's been your biggest hit uh, when it comes to you know investing into into startups? Have you got any any exits still? Uh, we are still very early, uh, so it's it's not that easy. Um, I I mean, to date, I think our investment at the Series A of Sorare is probably our flagship deal, uh, but you never know. It depends how they perform over the next few years. Um, if we had to take one lesson from that is um, sometimes you should not be too price sensitive uh, because it was a, it was a large round and, and a significant valuation but they managed to deliver a lot above that initial value um, so yeah that's that's maybe one learning from uh, but it's more an exception than a rule mm, got it uh, and when you when you get a success in, from from one investment, does it impact your mindset and does it give you um, a signal that you need to keep investing in that sector because you you know you got a bit of a success from that particular investment? Um, yes, but it should not. <laughs> <laughs> Because diversification is probably more important, so uh, you, you you should obviously you should you need to learn from your wins and mistakes. Um, but I think you need to keep on diversifying to edge your bets um, and 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 manage uh, it's risk management at the end of the day. Got it. Interesting. And uh, and just to follow up on that, you know, I recently read a a post from Jason Lemkin, who's a SaaS founder, who said that. When he looks at investing into startups, he looks at if if a startup is uh, growing at the scale of around eight percent per month, and then you know it's it's a good signal, and you know the company goes on to make money. And I think he says something like, in a seed round on a pre seed round, the company has to grow by two hundred percent, and a few other you know percentages that he talked about. Do you also look at or evaluate those sort of percentages, or do you think you know it's uh, when it comes to uh, investing in startups after product market fit, uh, the percentage of growth isn't that important, but, but, but you know, how the team is trying to solve it is more important. We, we do look at the numbers. Uh, we do look at the numbers, obviously, but it depends a lot on, because we invest from late C to series B and because we invest across many different sectors, you have to adjust your KPIs from one stage to another and from one industry to another. So it's, uh, unless you focus on one single industry at one single stage, it's harder to have set KPIs. You, you have to uh, one one clear KPI. So you do look at the numbers. Um, we invest at a, a stage where the, the team is still the most important element uh, because although you are reaching pro product market fit and you can start to see some numbers, uh, the one thing you can't change, change at this stage is the comp is a team, sorry, uh, and and the founders. Um, yeah. If you invest much later stage, um, like Series C, D, or something, that's when you can start to change the funding team, um, and therefore <laughs> numbers are becoming even more important. Uh, but at the stage where we invest, I would say team number team is priority number one, early metrics number two, and then market. Okay, got it, and and. and... You you talked about your 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 biggest hits, but what's been your biggest miss? And you know, does it does it also impact how you look at investing? Uh, you have any anti VC portfolio companies? Uh, sorry, anti portfolio companies. Um. Yes, there there are a few companies that we we did not invest in, and we wanted to invest in. It was uh when we were still operating as a club deal, and basically. If you don't have one of your investors, LPs that want to invest, then you can't invest. Um, and and that's when we there are a couple of deals that I really wanted to uh, 
uh, to do and, and we couldn't do. Um, but it's a shame, but that was uh, how we were operating at the time. So um, hard to, to blame us too much for that. Um, I think one, one, one learning is that, and it's very specific to us, we, we are a follower investor. Uh, so we, we follow a lead investor. And, and one, one learning, we already had, had it in mind when we started, but it's becoming more and more obvious. You, you need to understand exactly why the lead invest, is investing and, and both the uh, interest, intrinsic reasons, like the, the fundamental reasons and also the political reasons to make sure that that lead VC is going to provide the right level of support to the company over the long term. Um, and, and I'm saying that because there are a few companies where the lead was on paper a good lead, but the reasons were not the right ones and they did not provide the right level of support afterwards. Um, sorry, it's a, it's a, it's a <laughs> tricky answer, but basically we, we do spend a lot of time with the lead investors, not because we need their stamp on the deal, but we because we want to make sure that they are going to provide support. Okay, okay, got it. And uh, especially, you know, I wanted to understand about uh, emerging managers, you know, what are some of the biggest mistakes they make when they're approaching LPs? Hmm. Um, I don't know, to be honest. Um, I'm not sure. I think... I think, I mean, and, and it's probably a commonality across not only emerging managers, but what, what's tricky is to identify quickly if it's likely that the LP will invest. Uh, yeah. Because you, you, can, you can spend a lot of time with some LPs for them not to invest at the end of the day. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and I think the most difficult part in, in, in our job as emerging managers especially is to make sure that you you spot that early on so that you don't waste too much time uh, where you won't get any value yeah yeah makes sense and and, and what should all young uh, young people do know about you know when they're trying to enter the the venture landscape uh, very early in your career you did start off with the with the with the vc role but what advice would you give to young young people who want to get into uh, in this world of venture capital um it, for me, it's always the same thing. You have to be very patient. It's it's a it, it's a it's an industry that is paying over the long term. Uh, so you you need it takes time to build relationships with LPs. It takes time to build relationships with entrepreneurs. It takes time for your portfolio companies to mature enough to prove that you have made the right decisions. Um, so. Yeah, you, you really need to be patient. Um, and, and I think one, one thing that we, um, that we see, not with less so with uh, GPs, but mostly with uh, business angels or individuals that are trying to uh, do direct investments, is that they are rushing into their first investments. And, and, and that's a big mistake that we keep on seeing. Uh, if, when you invest in startups, it's it's like you you could wait until your opportunity number hundred before you make a first call, uh, and and that's that's not easy to do because once you've seen ten of them, you say okay, one of them should be good, uh, but reality it's more one out of hundred, if not more. Oh, okay, got it. Interesting. Um, and I quickly want to do the top three. What's your favorite business book? Uh, favorite business book is. Uh, Probably um, let my people go surfing uh, from Yvon Chouinard, uh, the founder of Patagonia, and and most likely because it's not really a business book. Uh, I mean, it's much more than that. it's it's a it's a life experience book more than business book. Oh, nice! Uh, we'll put that in show notes. And you know, if you can go back in time when you started with your VC firm, what is the one thing you would have focused on or done thing differently? Uh, 
Mm. I don't know, maybe maybe stay a bit longer in the VC industry when I started uh, 15 years ago or, or come back to it earlier than 2020. Um, I, I'm not disregarding what I've done in, in, in between. Uh, I, I, I love what I've done. Uh, and 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 I think I, I gained a lot of experience through that, but I really love what I do now as a VC uh, because I, I I feel very energized by meeting founders every day. Um, you you get to meet people that are more often than not very smart, uh, more often than not working on very interesting topics. And more often than not, some of the most advanced uh, thinkers in that industry. So, I mean, so inter intellectually speaking, it's it's an amazing expense. Got it. Interesting. And um, and finally, what's your what's your favorite online tool? For example, Gmail, Slack, Zoom. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's WhatsApp. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I'm saying unfortunately because uh, the tool is not great. Uh, it, I, it's not perfect uh, in terms of user experience, functionalities. There are plenty of things that I'm missing, but it's it's the most powerful tool to talk to people and, and get that uh, attention. Got it. Absolutely. Put that in the show notes. And although, or, or, what is the best way people can reach out to you and know more about Atletico, Atletico Ventures? Uh, LinkedIn is probably where we publish the most. Um, yeah, I would say LinkedIn. Sure. Well, put that in the show notes. Um, although, thank you so much for taking your time and speaking to us. I really enjoyed my conversation with you. Thank you. Thanks a lot.